So today on the Health Evolution Collective, I'm here with Dr. Ben Bickman. What an honor to have you here on my show. Thank you so much. Oh, Tracy, it is my pleasure. Thanks for the, thanks for the invitation. Oh, absolutely. So I have been following you for quite some time now. I absolutely love the work you do and the way you present it to people. It just is so easy to understand. Um, and you give people so much, so much information to help them with their health. Before we get into your talking about your awesome book, Why We Get Sick, which if everyone can see is right behind your shoulder there. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm waiting for my hard copy. It's really hard to get in Australia for some reason. So it's when it comes, I would, I'll be showing it, but that's the book. Uh, before we talk about that, can you just share a little bit about, I guess, um, you know, you're a scientist and professor and but what's led you to, to writing this book, Why, Why We Get Sick? Yeah, again, thanks for the invitation and for the introduction. Yeah, my focus as a scientist is, uh, in general terms, metabolic health, but it was a bit of an unexpected route, although it didn't take me long to get on it. But my, my initial graduate work was focused on muscle cells, and I was curious, uh, in, uh, I was curious about the process whereby a muscle cell, well, muscles would get bigger and better. But by the end of my master's degree, I was actually far more interested in fat cells. Around that time, uh, a few years prior to me um, go, uh, doing a master's degree, I had stumbled across this study that explored the, uh, the endocrine features of fat cells. Basically, it was this, to me, a discovery that fat cells actually release ho hormones, release proteins, and that some of these proteins are pro-inflammatory proteins. And that, at the time, was thought to be really the single variable in how someone could be obese, and that would start spilling into type 2 diabetes. It was this obesity-induced insulin resistance. And I'm getting a little too far ahead of myself. But nevertheless, my point being, what started as uh, a research interest in muscle cells quickly shifted to a research focus on fat cells. And, and now I'd say that's really the, the, the tissue or the cells that I focus on most as a cell biologist, namely fat cells. What are the variables that um, are stimulating growth of fat cells, shrinking of fat cells, fat cells behaving entirely differently, uh, you know, metabolic rate uh, differences? That's my focus now. And, and that means I focus a lot on the hormone insulin because you really can't understand a fat cell without looking at it at least partially through the lens of insulin. Fantastic. Well, we're going to really uh, understand what insulin is. And then, of course, the term insulin resistant, which is talked about a lot, but I think a lot of people don't really understand that. But before we do, can I ask you, uh, people also talk about metabolic health, and I've been guilty of that. You know, I had someone said to me, say to me the other day, what do you mean by metabolic health? What does that actually mean? Can you explain that a little bit? Right. That uh, That's... I suppose metabolic health probably has a different definition uh, according to every kind of biomedical scientist or clinician. To me, I suppose the simplest definition of metabolic health would be that the person is insulin sensitive. But if that's still a little too vague, then I would say metabolic health would be someone having an okay grade, if you will, on the five variables that are conventionally used to indicate the metabolic syndrome. And so, in other words, the metabolic health would be someone who has a normal waist circumference. Um, so if they measured their fatness around their waist, and, and then second, they have a normal blood glucose, a normal blood pressure, and then the last two are basically just normal lipid levels, normal triglycerides and HDL cholesterol. Those five variables constitute the constellation of what's called the metabolic syndrome. And so I suppose if we use that as a foundation, we could say in turn, well, metabolic health then is being okay um, in all of those categories. But the truth of the matter is, back to my original answer, all of those things are very much related to insulin resistance um, when they go poorly, or if they're working well, then it's an insulin sensitive person. Okay, oh, makes a lot of sense. So obviously, when we're talking about metabolic health, how our body can make energy, how it functions. So when we don't, we're not, you know, when we we have those conditions, so we're not 
than functioning optimally. We're tired. We don't have a lot of energy because our body is basically struggling to keep us well. Is that, yeah, that's kind yeah. of, yeah. That's right. That's right. But something you said also prompted another thought. One other perhaps definition of metabolic health would be based on this idea of, of fuel or energy that you mentioned. So for example, well, specifically, that would be someone who has metabolic flexibility. Um, and, and at its simplest, it's just this idea that the that human metabolism or our, our energy needs can shift between the two primary metabolic fuels, that when we've eaten a meal, we go to a glucose burning or sugar burning, you know, blood sugar, that being the primary fuel that the body is using. And then several hours after eating, in other words, getting into this at least mild state of fasting, then we shift to predominantly obtaining most of our energy from fat. So we go to you know fat burning, if you will. So this ability to shift from glucose burning to fat burning very readily when we eat and when we aren't eating, that is a good, also a good definition of, of metabolic health. But again, that idea is metabolic flexibility. But once again, even that can be seen through the lens of insulin insofar as insulin dictates what fuel we're using. Okay, so let's learn about insulin. So I think firstly, people, you know, don't even understand that it's a hormone. So what is its role? I know in the book, you go into a lot of detail and I definitely encourage people listening to get the book and really understand it. But just in terms of an, a, sh a brief summary yeah, on yeah. this amazing hormone. Yes, it is amazing. Uh, I think it really is un uh, just unappreciated given uh, given how relevant it is in so much health and disease the the most obvious effect or role of insulin is to control blood glucose and that's how most people understand it and that's okay that's fine because it is a very powerful influence it is really the single hormone that will lower blood glucose whereas there are multiple other hormones that will increase blood glucose so it, it does its job well now it's helped with other processes in the body that can also act to lower blood glucose. But that is the, the, the most sort of poster child um, example of what insulin does. It lowers blood glucose. But the truth is far more complicated. Uh, and that's because insulin affects every cell in the body. Literally every cell in our bodies has they have insulin receptors. So these little sites where the hormone insulin can come and, and dock and bind and then tell the cell to do something. And because every cell in the body has these insulin receptors and the different and, and the various cells in the body play different roles, they do different things, it's not surprising that insulin will do different things at different cells. But the theme of it, the general theme across all of the cells of the body is that insulin tells the cells what to do with energy. It can not only stimulate the uptake of energy in, in most cells, but it will also then tell that cell what to do with it. And once again, the theme of that is storage. Insulin wants to store energy, even to the point that it will lower metabolic rate in the body and, and, and just to help the body store more energy. So insulin abhors wasting, it abhors breaking things down. It just wants to build things up, including fat in our fat cells and have it get locked away untouched by the, by the body. So without insulin then, obviously we wouldn't be here. If we think about um, our evolution in times of you know, when food, we had to hunt for it and it wasn't very scarce like it is today, you know, that we can, we don't have to do anything for it apart from yeah. walk to the supermarket. Um, without insulin, we wouldn't have got through winter, would we? So that was, is that, is that that's kind of, yeah, oh, I'd like to explain it, yeah. Yeah, yes, absolutely. We would have no kind of metabolic insurance, if you will. We would have no energy storage if it weren't for insulin. It is, it is impossible to, in, to my knowledge, from any organism, from, from fruit flies to humans uh, and, and every other less complicated organism than humans and more complicated organism than fruit flies, uh, it, it, insulin must be present and indeed elevated in order for that organism to store any energy. I don't believe it is possible in any other uh, without insulin. You you take away the insulin and immediately this is an organism that loses its ability to store 
energy uh, in, in any way, including energy in the liver and very obviously lo loses the ability to store any energy in fat cells. So where have we all gone wrong then? Where, where has it gone wrong? So you talk in the book, um, so your book is Why We Get Sick. And I know um, in the introduction, um, well, Jason Fong talks about how, yeah. you know, how this has changed so much over probably only really a few generations. I mean, it used to be, um, you know, we got sick from, um, you know, dysentery and, and diseases and things like that. So how has it changed and why has it changed and what does it have to do with insulin? Right, yeah. Once, so we are now, um, we see obesity strictly through uh, this, this calorie-centric uh, paradigm or perspective. So we look at fat cell regulation only in the context of is energy being you know, used or, or, or stored and as if, as if the fat cell um, is just this, this simple kind of bank account idea of it's just these deposits and withdrawals that are just happening passively almost as if the energy, we eat it and then it just comes into the fat cell and comes out when we need it. But that is just not true. We are far more complicated organisms. You, in order to understand human obesity, I strongly believe we need to consider, yes, energy and calories, but also hormones. If we take hormones out of this equation, we're doomed because then we just fall into this, this cycle of, of failure of trying to starve ourselves to, to weight loss. And in, to your point a moment ago, in this environment, in today's world, hunger will always win. I actually, I stole this analogy from Gary Tobbs, a very wonderful author. I'd recommend anyone after they read my book, go read some of Gary's <laughs> books. Um, they're wonderful, but uh, he once shared this and then I stole it and I share it with my students. But when I discuss obesity in my pathophysiology class, I, I present this kind of caloric paradigm and then uh, we start poking holes in it. And I show them some of the data that challenges that it's just purely uh, a caloric imbalance. And part of this is I present this analogy, which is that I'm, I'm having the best chefs in the world come to my home. Everyone's invited. I want you to come as hungry as possible. What would you do to make sure you came to this glorious buffet as hungry as possible? And in, invariably, my 130 clever young undergraduates come to these two ideas, and that is they would exercise more in the time preceding the, 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 the dinner, and they would eat less exercise more, eat less. Those are the two pillars of the current dietary advice that we give people when we need them to lose weight. But hunger always wins. In this environment of readily accessible food, hunger will win. Now, I'm not saying there's no role for discipline and denial of indulgence. I, I do think that's very important. But I think we can help the person through that by not forcing hunger on them all the time. And, and when someone realizes that they can start leveraging, changing their insulin levels in order to favor um, this process, you know, that they don't have to be hungry, they can be eating, but they can eat in such a way to keep their insulin down. Well, then you are allowing the fat cells to share their energy, their fat with the body to be used. You also shift into that higher rate of fat burning and your metabolic rate, actual accounting for calories, which a, a caloric purist wants to do, um, the, the metabolic rate goes up um, even to the to the point where it can raise by almost 300 calories per day if someone's eating meals that are keeping insulin low. So addressing the endocrine aspect of obesity, namely insulin, uh, I think that the person really has a very effective tool that they now can use that they wouldn't have had otherwise if they're just focusing purely on calorie number. Yeah. Well, you've just really given us all a great reason to drop the belief that we have to be hungry in order to lose weight because I see it every day. It's one of the biggest challenges with most of my clients, you know, getting them to see that we actually can lose weight and, in fact, uh, we do it so much easier when we are not hungry and it does come from 
ma- you know, manipulating, if you like, insulin or understanding it, working with it, working with those hormones in our body. It's a huge thing because I know certainly I, until I was 40, that's how I thought and I was a personal trainer then and I was, you know, I was continuing to spread that that myth that it is about calories in, calories out. And if you're not feeling hungry, you're not going to be losing weight. What a revelation to see. We don't have to do that. And that to me is the biggest thing with dieting, you know, like it's why it just does not work because that horrible hunger that we experience and we fall off, We, as you said, hunger will always win. And then, of course, that cycle of what we tell ourselves, we we're not, we're hopeless or we're, we're not disciplined. We're not strong enough. You know, let's just, oh, yes. I just love that. Thank you. Thank you for spreading that message. And um, yeah, I get the book and I think everyone will understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and I would that. say the, the, the nuances with insulin and obesity, I certainly touch on that. Um, in my book, but there are some other wonderful books, including Jason Fung and Gary Tobbs yeah. that I would recommend anyone read to just get more of a well-rounded idea of obesity. Because while I certainly touch on that, and I'm a fat cell scientist, I look at it more in the context of overall disease in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So then um, what happens when things go wrong with insulin? Um, and one of the scary things as I read was that most people are actually walking around not even realizing that insulin isn't working, that they have insulin resistance. What's yes, going that's on right. there? It, it is, it is I, I consider it the most common or widespread disorder in the world. And, and so we, we are not only not diagnosing it correctly, but we're also not um, appreciating its role in other diseases which which means we're missing we're missing uh, the potential to treat a patient much much better um, and basically so with insulin resistance the simplest definition and you kind of mentioned this it's just when insulin isn't working the right way at various cells in the body now at some cells insulin's working perfectly fine but at other cells it is not and that imbalance actually becomes a problem when we appreciate the fact that in a body that is insulin resistant, insulin levels themselves are much, much higher than before. So those two features come together. Insulin isn't working the right way um, throughout the body and insulin levels it's themselves or itself is much higher. So some cells that are continuing to respond to insulin normally now are hyperactive with their insulin. Insulin is now telling the cell to do too much and the cell is sensitive to that signal and so it keeps doing too much but then other cells aren't really getting the signal very well at all. So those two variables are what comes into play, making insulin resistance the problem that it is. And in this, we could could almost, and I, as you know, from going through the book, it is shocking how many diseases, chronic diseases that we think would have no metabolic origins actually have at their core an an unavoidable metabolic origin. Like for example, the, the hyperinsulinemia that comes with the high insulin levels that someone has in insulin resistance. If we look at what that does at the ovaries in a woman, it's profound. The most common form of infertility in women is a disease called polycystic ovarian syndrome, where the the the, the ovaries are going through the um, menstrual cycle. The woman is going through the menstrual cycle. The ovaries are developing a lot of little eggs every month, but in order for the, all the rest of the eggs to go away, one of them must ovulate. And with that one egg ovulating from one of the ovaries, then all the other kind of budding little eggs will, will, will go away. But in the absence of one ovulating, all of those little eggs stick around and they become these big cysts in the ovaries. And that problem happens because the woman doesn't get this big estrogen spike, which she needs immediately preceding ovulation this big estrogen spike and one other hormone, well, many hormones come into play, but estrogen spike is a big one. Too much insulin blocks the ovaries from making that big estrogen spike. Insulin inhibits the process whereby, in fact, this is fascinating, but all estrogen hormones were once testosterone. The ovaries convert the testosterone into the estrogens. And this happens in men and women. Of course, in women, it happens more, and women thus have higher estrogen levels than men. But that one enzyme that um, mediates that conversion from testosterone to estrogens is inhibited by insulin. 
And so the woman who has insulin resistance and high insulin levels at the level of the, at her ovaries, the insulin is directly preventing that big estrogen surge, preventing ovulation. And as a background problem, she has too much testosterone and she'll, she'll, she'll start to have other problems like more coarse body hair, for example, um, that, 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 or acne, um, like you might have even like in a young boy in, a, in an adolescent yeah. boy who's going through a big testosterone surge. So, so that's a problem at the ovaries. When we look at the brain, um, some of the brain's energy comes from glucose from the blood and insulin mediates some of that movement of the glucose into the brain. And so when the brain becomes insulin resistant, it can't get enough of its energy from glucose anymore. And so there's this kind of gap of energy. You know, the brain's energetic need is up here. Glucose used to give all of it to the brain, but now the brain's become insulin resistant. And now we have the, it, it, the, this gap where the glucose can't meet the need and, and the person starts to develop brain disorders, including Alzheimer's disease and including migraines, frankly, even migraines are looked at as a bit of an energetic deficit in the brain. So I could keep going. We could talk about muscles, bones, joints, liver, um, kidneys, eyes. It, it, it suffice it to say virtually every chronic disease has some connection to insulin resistance where the insulin resistance is either explicitly causing the problem or it's exacerbating it or accelerating the problem. So what I find interesting with what you're saying there, because, you know, I think what um, people don't understand that it isn't, you know, a neat and homogenous condition, you know, it's not that you're either insulin resistant or you're not. It's a, it is a spectrum. And mm -hmm. as you said, clearly it affects the body in different um, parts and in different ways. Is that, I just wanted to ask you, is that kind of potluck? So if I was insulin resistant in the brain versus somebody else, uh, in their ovaries. Is that a genetic thing? Is it just potluck? How, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there could certainly be some instances of that happening, but, the, but I would, I, I, that would be very uncommon. The common format, or, or not format, the common process would be that the fat cells become insulin resistant first. So there, there is no total consensus on this. So I'd want anyone to sort of take this with a grain of salt where I'm speculating a bit, but I would, but I, if at the risk of sounding smug, it's informed speculation. So I think the fat cells become insulin resistant first. That's the first domino to fall, but then it starts bumping into the other dominoes or basically spreading that insulin resistance around throughout the body. And then what would cause someone to then have, say, the ovaries get affected before the liver would, for example, you know, if we put take two organs that are just, you know, right around the same area. I don't know. I'm not sure what would predispose one, what, what the next tissue would be versus the other. But in general, I think it would be safe to assume that the fat cells are the first to become insulin resistant. And as they become insulin resistant, they start leaking fat throughout the body and they start leaking those pro-inflammatory proteins that I mentioned earlier, these what, what's called cytokines. And those two things are really the key variables, the key parts of the equation e that equals insulin resistance, the leaking of fat, the free fatty acids from fat cells and the fat cells leaking these pro-inflammatory proteins. As these start to spread through the body, they cause other tissues to become insulin resistant. So that leaking of fat, is that, that's a triglyceride marker, is it? Is that what we get tested for? Yeah. So actually yeah. these fats would be the free fatty acids. So when the, when the fat cells are breaking down their fats, they are leaked as free fatty acids. The triglycerides are predominantly coming from the fat we make in the liver, which is again, what, what insulin, that's another insulin signal. Insulin tells the liver to make triglycerides. Okay. All right. So what I'm hearing from you here is that insulin resistance isn't just a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. We haven't actually really even touched on that yet. You've talked about all these other conditions that insulin resistance is the precursor for, but yet most people will tend to think that it's di type 2 diabetes that is the, the biggest risk factor or the only thing we're likely to get if we're insulin resistant, but that's clearly not the case. 
No, that's right. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's not even, it's far from a guarantee that the person would progress to full on type two diabetes. What is far more likely is that they would have hypertension. So high blood pressure, fatty liver disease, they may, and, and in a woman, they, she would have polycystic ovarian syndrome. A man would have erectile dysfunction. That's also a, a common early symptom or sign of insulin resistance. Yes. Mm -hmm. So waiting, that, and that's part of the problem. And, and I do emphasize the word waiting. When we look at insulin resistance strictly through the lens of type 2 diabetes, it is unfair to the hormone insulin, which I believe is the more relevant one. And, and we shift our focus to glucose. But the tragedy of that perspective is that as someone, if we look at all metabolic health as just this process or just through the lens of glucose, as if it's like a progression just towards type 2 diabetes, then we're only looking at the glucose and we fail to acknowledge the reality that behind the scenes underlying that normal glucose is this ever increasing insulin level. Uh, that the, where the body has to work harder and harder. The insulin has to work harder and harder in order to keep that glucose in check. That is the insulin resistance. But if we, in other words, if we looked at the insulin, we would have detected the problem potentially decades, 10 or 20 years before the glucose would have changed. But we don't look at insulin. It has not made its way into just the common clinical diagnostic when someone comes in for a conventional or just routine lab visit. We always measure glucose. We always measure lipids. And I think those are fine. They certainly have value. But if we really want to detect insulin resistance, we've got to bring in insulin. We have to allow it into the discussion. We do, but as you say, it's not a standard test. In fact, just yesterday a client told me that her doctor refused to check it because I give a recommended list of what are the blood tests to go and ask for, for you, from your doctor and one of them is fasting insulin. No, wouldn't do it. And, yeah. you know, it, it is when you understand what you're saying that this is going to give us, you know, tell us what's going on with our metabolic health 10 to 20 years prior to being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or you know, of course, we know PCOS for females. That's usually very, you know, teenagers are, get, are getting yes. that. And then, of course, you know, um, breast cancer is another big one, I, you know, I, I know you've spoken about. And being mostly women listening to this podcast, that's something I'd love to, to talk about yes. as well. But it's so, why? How? Why is this happening? <laughs> oh, I know, isn't it? Well, I, I often say that it, it, it's, it, it was forgivable. It was forgivable that the focus was exclusively on glucose because of two reasons. One, traditionally, the most obvious sign of diabetes was the ex excessive urine production, what we call polyuria. The person was just urinating gallons and gallons of water, every of urine every day. And that was because of the high glucose. And we knew that even early physicians, hundreds, thousands of years ago, because the, the, glu the urine was enriched with the glucose, uh, and they'd see animals, dogs would want to come and lick up that glucose, and the flies would just swarm to it to eat all those sugars from the urine. And so the most obvious symptom, polyuria, was directly a result of the high glucose levels. And then second, second reason why it was forgivable is that scientifically, we were able to measure glucose from the blood far, far earlier than we could ever measure insulin. So we just, we had the technology to measure this molecule when we did not have the technology to measure insulin. And even nowadays, as you just mentioned, it, it, it's getting insulin measured is not a simple test. It is a full on blood test at the lab. And it often incurs a cost that depending on the, the healthcare model or in the U.S., the insurance that a person has, it, it just it might not get covered. And so the, the, the physician may be reluctant, even if the physician appreciates the value of insulin, they may be reluctant simply because they know the insurance won't pay for this, I can't bill it, and the patient doesn't want to pay for it, then I have to get in a fight with the patient. So yeah. it's, it's unfortunate. But given how it is getting easier and easier to measure insulin, uh, tip, these costs are coming down it's getting less forgivable to not measure insulin. Now, I will say there is a poor man's method where if someone has gone into their physician and gotten or the clinic and gotten a blood test, if they can measure their triglyceride, they, they, they will almost always get a triglyceride number and an HDL cholesterol number. 
and they mm -hmm. can take at least in the U.S. in the milligrams per deciliter. I don't know how it would um, equate with millimolar in in Australia, but if if it's looked at, um, but with milligrams per deciliter, it's um, 1.5. If if the triglyceride divided by HDL cholesterol is less than 1.5, it is a strong indicator that the person is insulin sensitive. So even if they don't get their insulin measured, if they if they meet that or or below that 1.5 ratio of triglycerides to HDL cholesterol, then they're very likely good. Fantastic. I will put that down below in the show notes too for people and I'll work it out that I've got all that yeah, down because I've yeah. got a couple of clients in the US. Um, so yeah, that can get a bit tricky. Well, and I'm, I'm from market. Canada originally, so oh, I should be sorry. able to, I should be able to do this fluently, but I can't, I'm too, I'm too oh. American now. <laughs> of course, of course. So just going on then from what you were saying there, there's, so you can get a blood test and there's, you know, looking at your triglycerides and your HDL is one um, great one. And of course we've got our HbA1c is another one, which is another good marker. But what would be the other, some of the signs we might be looking for in our body to give us an indicator that maybe we are insulin resistant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I believe the most obvious often is hypertension. If a person has high blood pressure and and they are even a little overweight like they you know they have a bit of a bigger waist circumference you know, very very likely done they need to look no further they're very likely insulin resistant there are some other signs that we see in some people which is changes in the skin where if the person has a little more fat on them they'll have a little bit of a ring around the back of their neck and that is the most obvious spot, but it can also happen on the armpits. Uh, but they will start to have two skin changes. And, and this is typically more advanced insulin resistance, but they will have these little skin bumps called skin tags. And they do kind of bump up like a little stalk almost, like a little column of skin. And then they will have uh, a, a darkened, thickened, more rough skin. And that's a, a condition called acanthosis nigricans. But it, it basically is that the skin gets kind of darker and rough. Now, of course, on a pale fellow like myself, that becomes quite obvious. On the darker the complexion, the, the darkening of the skin will become harder to see. But the touch, the feel, the very coarse rough skin that will of course still be very obvious to the touch even even to the to sight okay so there's some definite definite clear markers but again uh we have to be aware of it and also knowing that you know how much of what we carry on and think is normal we put down to um aging a normal part of aging i've actually been told myself i went to a local gp i needed to just get some bloods <laughs> done and um, I, I know my GP's in the city I couldn't be bothered to go all the way in I thought I'll just go in and ask him for and I asked for my I think it was I think it was just even just the HbA1c he was like well, what do you want that for you're thin you don't need to worry about anything like that so this is the the stuff I think people are up against when they do go to their doctor and ask for these types of things but there's so much we can do ourselves to um, see you know, where we're at in terms of our metabolic health and, you know, not put it down to aging because so much of it we think is normal. It's not normal and it can be reversed. Oh, yes, yes. We, I absolutely agree. We should fight the good fight. We should not just look at our worsening metabolic health and just shrug our shoulders. There is, there's too much to live for. There's too much to enjoy. Uh, much of my motivation nowadays is I look at my little kids and uh, first of all, I tremendously miss them not being babies anymore, but I'm already looking forward to them having babies and they're still all young, but I'm thinking I want to be a really fit grandpa. I, I want, but even if someone doesn't have that sort of familial motivation, if you will, there, you can, um, it's just self-interest uh, to want to just live healthy and then die. We don't want that prolonged morbidity of not being able to get up, not being able to do things we enjoy, and then having a miserable last 20 years of life just filled with pain and, and disease. No, we should fight it and, and then be healthy, fit up until the end, and then have this what we call a compressed morbidity. We get sick and die in, a, you know, in months. 
Yeah, that's what I want to. And I, I don't think people realize that it is, this is what happens. It's, you know, we're so clever in medicine at prolonging life. It's the quality of life that is just crap and extended. And the impact that that has on the family, I think, you know, we have to look at all of that, you know, them having to care for you, um, all the stuff they've got to do to look after you. You know, I think if we can take all that into consideration, we're going to be a little more motivated to go the hard yards to do lifestyle change or change what we eat or do whatever it is that we need to do to help reverse this stuff, even if it's hard, because it's hard, you know, yes. as we know, you know, we have, there's so many factors that come into it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it because I'm with you. I want to just, I just want to go. I don't want to have to go through 20 years of slow, progressive, horrible, Stuff. No, no, but I like what you said. I, I totally agree. I love what you said, though, where uh, modern medicine technology basically allows us to live with disease. And, and that, that's a sad reality where now more than ever, it's, it's an interesting kind of dichotomy. For example, if we look at heart disease, which um, I believe I'm sure in Australia, it's the same in the US, that's the leading cause of death. What's yeah. so interesting, though, is that the number of people dying from heart disease actually has trend, trended down a little bit, but the number of people with heart disease has spiked dramatically. And so we have more people than ever getting it, which is totally a result of our lifestyle. But because of modern technology, the person can live with it. And 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 they're not, and I think we we almost disincentivize them from, like you said, doing the hard work to turn that around. We are a, increasingly a global culture that is really just interested in taking a pill, but no pill can cure a chronic disease. It can only treat symptoms. It can never fix it. And, and that goes even more, the is, is even more the case with insulin resistance and, and all the chronic diseases that stem from it. These are not diseases that are caused by the absence of a drug. These are diseases that are caused by poor lifestyle, and thus lifestyle is either the culprit or the cure. We've just got to do the hard work to change it. Yeah, so I would definitely want to talk about the lifestyle next. Before we get into that, which is to the more, you know, what we can do about it, can you just share a little bit for my listeners around the link between insulin resistance and something like breast cancer? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier. I I should have got, mentioned it then. No, yeah. Okay. So in the case of, in the case of breast cancer, <clears throat> I don't I don't believe the insulin resistance is causing the cancer, but there's no doubt that insulin resistance and 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 bad glucose management is exacerbating. And and by that I mean, if you this was a study done in in women where they they compared the the a biopsy of normal breast tissue with a breast tumor. And what they found in the breast tumor, it had seven times more insulin receptors than the normal breast tissue did. That was part of the mutation that part of its, you know, in cancer, it is just a series of mutations that allow the cancer cell an advantage over the normal cells. It can grow better and faster. Insulin tells cells to grow. And so by having seven times more insulin receptors than the normal breast tissue, this tumor is, we can conclude, seven times more responsive to insulin's growth signals. Now, that alone is bad, but when we combine it with the high glucose that people have often, or at least constantly eating um, foods that turn into glucose in the blood, glucose is the fuel for cancer cells in tumors. If you look at human tumors, they use glucose as the fuel. In fact, their glucose use is roughly 200 times greater than normal cells. So these things have an incredible need for energy. And so in the case of insulin resistance, it's a perfect storm. We are giving them a lot of insulin, stimulating that growth to which they're more sensitive, very likely anyway, with more insulin receptors. And then we are fueling that growth by giving them all the glucose they want because that is the only fuel, like, like a bacteria, it is the only fuel a cancer cell can use. It exclusively relies on glucose as, as its fuel. So in the case of insulin resistance and breast cancer, we are giving the cancer, the tumor cell, all it needs. 
Wow. And we've got a long way to go, I think, for people to, well, you know, specialists to give that advice to women and show that, um, you know, I just, I've, I mean, I've heard of it quite a bit now because I'm in the space, but, you know, you go outside the bubble and I don't think it's, a, it's certainly not the common knowledge. Oh, no, no, no. And certainly not here. And I'm sure it's the same in Australia. The mm. American Cancer Society, as, as much as ever, is still promoting a low fat, high carbohydrate diet, rich with complex carbohydrates and whole grains. Um, the reality is all that stuff turns into glucose. It, you can put a pretty little package on it and say that it's a whole grain and, and the, the intestines don't care. It digests it into the same glucose molecules for, that we get from any other um, source of starches and sugars and the cancer cell doesn't care where the glucose came from. So that's a nice way to move into what we can do about that, do about it then. So in terms of lifestyle change, um, you know, food is obviously a pretty big one, you know, that we can ultimately at the end of every day or during every day, we choose what we put in our mouth. Now we may be driven by metabolic uh, imbalances and, you know, um, addictions or sugar sort of, you know, urges spiking through us, but there's certainly a lot we can see around that. So let's talk about your take on, um, I guess, what should we be eating, I suppose, to give ourselves the best chance at having a healthy metabolic, you know, metabolic health? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I like what you mentioned a moment ago, um, sort of alluding to this this habits or even dare I say addictions. And so the advice, I won't even call it advice. My sentiments on the best dietary changes in order to improve insulin resistance are, are simple as I'll explain in a moment, but I wouldn't want any of your listeners to think I'm being condescending or smug when I say that, because while the ideas are simple, I fully understand implementing them is not so easy. And that's yeah. because we start dealing with addictions. And namely, when someone is sitting around on a Saturday night enjoying a movie at home, no one is sitting there thinking, oh, I sure could use a plate of scrambled eggs. No <laughs> one. No one says that. What a wonderful world it would be. No, we are, we are, at least for me, I am craving something salty and crunchy or sweet and gooey. And each of those is going to be essentially built on some sugar and starch of some kind, you know, with some yeah. yummy fat thrown in there. Um, and, and that combination is a wicked, delicious one. So I, <laughs> I appreciate anyone listening. I, I know these are not easy. Even as long as I've been doing it, the, the little kind of addictions or the cravings that I just mentioned, I still feel that regularly. Uh, and, and it's just, there is that matter of willpower or even dare I say a support a support network, you know, letting your loved ones know what you're trying to do and genuinely soliciting their help. Um, but that's outside my territory. Let me just stick with what I think are the scientifically sound principles. So first one is, I think first, to me, it is first for a reason because it is the most important and possibly the hardest. And that is control carbohydrates. Yeah. And essentially, someone just needs to be smart about their starches and their sugars. With regards to sugars, it's acknowledge the sugar when you're getting it. What people don't know, they might think they're cutting out sugar, but sugar is in virtually every condiment. It's in, in most, I think over 70% of all packaged foods, there is sugar in there in some substantial amount. So we need to control the amount of sugar we're eating. And, and then just be smarter about the starches we're eating. And, and basically the simplest idea there is to focus on whole fruits and vegetables. And, and there's a, maybe a little more nuance there depending on how healthy the person is. But basically that's going to be a safe bet. Focus on fruits and vegetables, dump everything else. Then the second idea is to prioritize protein to make sure you eat enough protein that you feel satisfied and that you're meeting your body's genuine needs for protein. And that, uh, I, I don't want this to sound um, controversial or smug or offensive, that can't come from plant proteins. Mm -hmm. Plant proteins are inferior in every way. I hate if that's an offensive idea to some, but it is, it is quantifiably true. Plant proteins neither have the, the, the right mix of amino acids, nor do they have the full availability even. So 
there are there are molecules in these plant proteins that that directly inhibit our intestines ability to digest the protein anyone who's curious about this look up molecules called tannins or trypsin inhibitors or phytic acids. These are found in all of the plant proteins and it is explicitly inhibiting our ability to break down those, those amino, those proteins from the plants. So it's a double whammy. We don't get the amino acid mix we want in the first place. And even second, we can't even get the ones we think we're getting because we can't digest the, pr the plant very well. So focus on the animal proteins and the best way egg white and meat. And interestingly, the best proteins, and those are the best proteins for humans, um, especially whey and egg whites, or, or eggs, I, I should say, or dairy and eggs. Interestingly, those three best sources, dairy, eggs, and meat, all come with fat. Fat, and that's the third pillar, is don't fear fat. Eat fat, enjoy fat, focus on natural or ancestral fats, namely fats from animals and fruits. And the fruit fats are pretty much coconuts, olives, and avocados. Yeah. And those are fats that you get, the oils that you get just from pressing the flesh of the fruit. Nothing to do with the seeds or pits. Nope. It's the flesh of the fruit that our early ancestors for thousands of years, all they needed to do was just step on them. And they would have started getting the oil from these, the flesh of these fruits. So they are ancestral. We are well suited to eat, to eat them. And my point about fats and proteins coming together is relevant because there are studies to show that when you combine fat and protein together, you help the protein work better. So this one study in particular found that muscle growth was the highest when fat and protein were mixed, and it was higher than protein alone. So there's something kind of doubly anabolic about that mix. And fat helps the guts digest protein. I have had so many people tell me their stomach gets very upset when they eat just pure whey, like a, just a pure whey protein shake. And then I say to them, mix it with fat, mix it one to one fat to protein by mass, not by calorie, but by mass. So if you're getting 20 grams of whey, get 20 grams of fat with that whey. And when you eat fat, you have the release of bile acids from the, from the gallbladder and bile helps it facilitates those um, protein digestive enzymes. So it actually helps the guts digest the protein better. So now you're getting more of the amino acids that you want. So those are the three pillars to, to just um, uh, sort of refresh them or, or reiterate them. Control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, and don't fear fat. And then the fourth principle is don't be afraid to skip meals, basically. Intermittent fasting, yeah. Uh, or, or time-restricted eating can be extremely effective. Um, and, and someone just needs to be smart, be deliberate about it. Uh, and I say that because too often I see people who get into this, they almost look at intermittent fasting as a, a glorious form of binging and purging. And I don't mean actually like bulimia, but, but they will they will wait all day and then eat a big dinner and they got so hungry, they overeat, they indulge in junk food because they let themselves just get too hungry. They didn't plan well. And then they feel such remorse. They feel so full and they sleep so poorly that they wake up the next day saying, I'm going to fast all day. And then they do the same thing. They get to dinner. They, they've gotten too hungry. They overeat. And I say this because I have seen that tendency in myself where I, I end up using intermittent fasting as a crutch to indulge in behave in, in bad eating habits. Mm. And so, but, but again, I, it can be extremely effective. I'm a, an enormous advocate of it. Um, but a person needs to be smart about it. It's not just something I do. I don't believe there's a lot of value in just shrugging your shoulders and say, oh, I'm going to fast and not have a plan um, for how you end the fast. In fact, I, I dare say how you end the fast is the most important part of the fast. There's so much in there. How fascinating. I would yeah. love to to yeah. really <laughs> to and I would have asked you about the plant versus animal protein anyway, because I mean, I'm, you know, a huge advocate of animal proteins. I've looked into it so much. I've had so many amazing people on this show. Just you know, you you peel it back. We're not talking about ideology here. We're talking about physiology and what our body, you know, is optimum on. And when we understand it from that pers perspective, it's all so much easier of course there's all those other layers as we know around yeah. it but at least for us to make decisions around what to fuel our body 
it's much easier to do when we understand what is going to be optimum and what you know yes. we're going to get the most out of when we do eat. Yes, um, that's right. In fact, I look at plant protein uh, as a bit of a racket. Um, and I say this with some informed experience when a couple of my older brothers and I, when we wanted to, we wanted to make a low carb, um, meal replacement shake. And we, we talked about my brothers, um, not being scientists. They had said, well, let's, we should look at pea protein. That's because it's, it's just such a commonly used protein. And I would want a listener to know they should be very cynical when they look at the branding on a, on a meal replacement shake or a protein shake because pea protein or any of the plant proteins are a fraction of the cost of, of animal proteins. They are so cheap, but you can see the incentive from a manufacturer or the company. They can one, buy a protein that is very, very cheap. And then two, they can kind of virtue signal they can they can brag about how they have plant proteins these are not animal proteins these are plant-based proteins and they're nowadays people are so seduced by that idea where where kind of pop culture is just waging war on our omnivorous nature as humans our absolute undeniable evolutionary reliance on animal products now it's like we're ashamed of that we're doing everything we can to walk away from our absolute natural biology and and so they want to they want to brag about how it's plant based that's nothing to brag about it is not healthy for the individual it is not healthy for the planet uh, that's a bit beside the point but and it also just creates a wonderful profit motive or incentive for the company they can make a lot more money off of you by selling junk yeah Yep. And it isn't, you know, like people like Diana Rogers from Sustainable Dish, you know, that fantastic book she's yes. just released. I mean, there's so many great people doing great things to show. Sustainable farming is actually going to help the planet. So again, what we're up against is dogma and misinformation. And, you know, I think we have to just be cynical. Exactly what you said. We've got to come across everything with a cynical perspective. Um, but it can be very, very hard, can't it, for the lay person to to know what to believe and to know what's true. You know, people are saying black and white. No, you oh, know, know. there'll be someone that will say plant, but no, you're wrong. Plant based is optimal. Yep. I know. I know. And I, I, I absolutely appreciate that. It, it's, I, I have nothing but genuine um, compassion for people that are struggling with this. And indeed, even for people that, that may, they're, they're, they may know just the, the, the reason, the, the, the fact that humans are omnivores and yet they still have a conflict in them this ethical dilemma of eating an animal there's something there's something sad about that but it doesn't change the reality of our world and this is cliche to say but something must die for something to live even the plant that person is eating that plant grew from the nutrients that came from dead things uh, and, and that dead thing once lived because of the nutrients that came from a plant. Uh, it, it is it is an undeniable reality of our world. And so, for those of us that embrace this omnivorous nature of humans uh, of our species, I do think, at the risk of sounding silly, religious, or philosophical, I do think there's something to be said for appreciating the life that is lost for ours to go on. I think there's something beautiful in that reality of acknowledging this was a death and and it was necessary because I need to live, my family needs to live. We shouldn't be ashamed of that, um, but we also, I think, should acknowledge it. I do think there's something beautiful in acknowledging that. I, I want my children to know that an animal dies. Uh, when we, when we buy our meat from a local, it's a professor actually in a different department here on my camp, on my, on my university, we buy all of our beef from him. I want them to know that this was a, a real animal and it died for us. That's okay. It's okay that that happened. Uh, mm -hmm. it, but, but we can also feel a little sad, but grateful. Absolutely love that. I think, I think that's fantastic. And, um, it just puts a another perspective on it. I think it's very easy to lose sight of of that evolutionary omnivorous nature that we've come from. As I said, when we never have to hunt for food, we never have to be in a position where we're starving. Now, 
you know, like we have that luxury, most of us in the Western world, of course, not all the world has that luxury, but in the Western world, we can just go to the supermarket. We, there's no understanding of the processes behind that anymore. And I think to get, you know, that that is important, that gratitude and to understand where it's coming from in all this conversation. There's not enough of that around. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's mm. it's the dad in me. I have to say it. It's part of my dad routine. <laughs> How many children have you got? I have three, three little babies, uh, 13, 10 and seven. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. I think it does change you, doesn't it? Com becoming a parent, the world looks quite oh, different. <laughs> uh, it's everything. It's everything. Uh, I would I would just say as much as we're spending all our time right now talking on science and that's appropriate, it, it's why I'm interesting. All of this, this career is, it all serves one end, which is to provide for my wife and my children. So I am number one, husband, father, far, far number two is scientist, professor. Oh, I love it. Well, uh, husband, father, I probably should let you get back to your family. Thank you so much for sharing. It's been so, such a pleasure. I've loved every second. I could ask you a million other questions, but I will let you go. And of course, please, everybody buy Dr. Ben's book because there is so much in there that can really empower you to make the choices that you need to make for your health. There is just, yeah. Please buy it. And thank you for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks again for the uh, in invitation. I had a really, really great time. Oh, thank you.